You strike me as somebody who is very even keel, very sweet natured. Um, what What's an example of a toxic emotion you've held on to? Guilt. As like a parent or? 100% as a parent. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest turning points in my life was when my son got sick when he was six months old. Mm. That is why I do what I do today. So, you know, first child, suddenly at six months, has a convulsion. We're not sure he's going to make it through the night. We're in a foreign hospital in France. It turns out that he had a preventable vitamin deficiency that nearly killed him. There's a huge rabbit hole there, but just that is the summary of what happened. Mm. I, as a, you know, externally, you would call me a highly qualified doctor. I've got my physician exams for being a specialist. I've got my general practitioner exams. I've got an immunology degree. With all of my training, with all the prestigious places I went to train, right, it didn't mean anything because I wasn't able to prevent my son from nearly dying from a preventable vitamin deficiency, mm. right? So what happens? I feel guilty, right? I feel right. I now I'm gonna get my son back to optimal health as if this had never happened. That was the challenge I set out to myself. Sure, modern medicine saved his life in the acute phase, but the chronic impacts of, and it was a vitamin D issue. Mm. So I was thinking, well, if my son has had no vitamin D for his whole life, and while he was in the womb, and that's a critical nutrient for your immune system to develop, what impact has that had? Is that why he has such bad eczema? Is that why he has allergies, et cetera, et cetera. So I felt so guilty and that guilt drove me to actually find out how to get him fully better. Mm. I'm very, very lucky to say he's a happy, thriving nine-year-old boy today, S super well, super healthy. Um, this led me on this path which I am on today. That has given me this drive and this mission to go out and try and help as many people as possible. But that guilt, whilst it drove me to get where I've got to, it also had an unintended consequence, which is, you know, I wasn't showing up as a father in the best way that I could. He doesn't need his father to be guilty. He doesn't need me to hold on to this sort of baggage. That was affecting how I was parenting. You know, I, I would have my own emotional baggage. I would probably be overly focused on him. And in the last year, 18 months, that is starting to go. I don't have that guilt. What do they talk about in the book? Like, what, what's the trick to letting go? There is no trick, man. There's no hack to it. It is a long process of self-reflection. But reading about emotions, reading about examples of where they might come from and how they can impact someone, that helps to shine a light on yourself. You go, oh, I recognize that trait in myself. Sometimes awareness is all it takes. Sometimes you are living a life that you think this is your personality, right? People say, this is how I am. Hold on a minute. I realize now that I didn't know how I was. I didn't know what, what I thought my personality was is not my personality. It was simply what I had absorbed over my life and I was responding to what I'd absorbed. Now that I understand that and I've started to peel away those layers, I no longer have the guilt, right? Various addictive tendencies that I may have had in my life, right? I don't really have them anymore. That's not because I've tried to address them. It's because as I feel, I guess as I feel freer in myself, I no longer need to numb um, have you, have you come across Gabor Mate's work? Never heard those syllables put you, together before. You would absolutely again? love Gabor Mate. Gabo Mate. Gabor, G-A-B-O-R. G -A -B -O -R. Got it. Mate, M-A-T-E. Okay. I'm surprised because I think you would love his work. And his whole, he's a, he's a psychiatrist. Well, he's actually a GP, but he's like one of the world's leading addiction specialists. He's worked with, um, you know, drug addicts in downtown Vancouver, really, really deprived area. And he looks at addiction as, he says all addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sugar, sex, shopping, come down to the same thing. And in his language, he would say it's down to childhood trauma. And he defines trauma as being either a bad thing has happened to you or not enough good things have happened. Hmm. 
right? It's a really simplistic way of looking at it, but I think there's real merit to his view. And he's got a lot of experience in looking at it this way. And I really resonate with that. And I think what it comes down to, uh, Tom, is this whole idea that if we don't feel whole in ourselves, right? If we feel that there's a bit missing, we will, you know, we will try to fill that with other things, you know, whether it's sugar, whether it's booze, whether it's shopping, we will use other things to give us that buzz. And as we feel more complete, and this is what how I feel I'm going on this journey, as I start to understand myself and let go of these negative emotions, I just feel those compensatory behaviors I'm no longer adopting, not because I'm actively trying not to do them, but because it's no longer serving me. And then you take it back to something super simplistic, like as a doctor, how many people are trying to quit sugar, right? And you can tell them how bad sugar is for them, right? Or too much sugar, I should say. Mm -hmm. And they can use willpower to get them to a certain point. But I find it's never really, a few people for sure manage to do it that way. But most people, they'll do it for two weeks, for three weeks. But unless the underlying drive behind it, if the underlying stress that caused it in the first place is, gets addressed, they're going to flip back to the same behavior. Same with booze and alcohol. And so I guess why I like that book so much is because I think coming across that book has coincided with me going down this path of emotional growth. I don't, if you had put that book in my hand five years ago, I probably would have put it right back down. I probably would have had a look. Like, I don't get this. All right. Now you're going to have to tell me what primed you to be open to that. Because this is probably the thing that frustrates me the most in life is that you can't want it for somebody. And I say that in response to this because when I look at people that really are struggling to make that change, there's some loop, some pattern, some mental pain, hole, wound, trauma, something, fear, limitation, blocker, wound, to use screenwriting language, that they have that until they're able to pierce that veil and realize that they have the, and in fact, I'll use microbiome language to really uh, make it medical for a second. So when the microbiome gets into dysbiosis, you get some of the microbes end up getting covered in that, uh, the film, I forget what it's called exactly. And it basically makes it impossible to get rid of them because anything that you're trying to use as an agent to yeah. eradicate them just hits that, that coating that they have on them and, and is unable to penetrate to get to them. And so you can give people all the amazing advice in the world and they have this biofilm around their mindset and you cannot get to them and with but then like it you're alluding to here oftentimes there's one thing something that happens either the death of their father or something else that pierces through that biofilm and now they have access to actually change and my mission in life is to figure out how to pierce that so that they can hear it so that they can understand for their own reasons either letting it go or recognizing the, cause I think sometimes it's, it might be there's a guilt or something like that. And sometimes it's just not understanding the way the mind works and understanding how to build things like desire or self-love or self-worth or uh, that your beliefs are malleable or your values are malleable, all of that stuff, just simply not recognizing that that kind of stuff is true. So you have these two things. One, you can't pierce the veil. They have a belief or um, there's something that, I think basically the trauma creates a worldview that is impenetrable. And then on the other side of that, then it's, do they actually understand once they penetrated it, do they actually understand how to make the change? I think your microbiome analogy is so freaking good. Honestly, it's, it's, such a, it's such a great way of looking at that problem, which is this, you know, when we see it, we wanna help all those people around us, those close to us, hey, hey, look, if you only just do this, it never works, very rarely works. I, I also, think about this a lot. One of the things I ponder the most, I would say, is what causes people to change? You know, do, does a human being need to come across significant adversity in order to start looking at things and start to shake their foundations and start to go on that journey of change? I've heard you talk about this, as I have with a good friend of both of ours, Rich, a Rich Roll. And, you know, Rich will talk about that whole incident where, yeah, he needed that pain. He needed that adversity to go on that journey. And in many ways, it's a tragedy really, isn't it? Because we don't really want everyone to have to go through that level of suffering before they start to go on that growth journey. But then 
is there any other way? Is that necessary in some way? And I really want to believe that there is. And I, I actually like everything. I think it is so highly variable sure. that yes, some people absolutely have to hit rock bottom and other people can do it faster. or Other people's rock bottom is more shallow than other people. Here's, here's what bothers me in, in this space that I'm deeply in and you're maybe a more professional, like uh, qualified version of like the self-help universe is you get people who talk like there is no human tragedy. There's fucking human tragedy, man. And there are people that they, they not only do they not escape it, their kids don't escape it and their parents didn't escape it and their grandparents didn't escape it. And it is just cycle after unending cycle of people who are unable to figure out how to get control of their own internal experience and thusly their internal experience borders on torture. It is a level of self cruelty that you would never like subject upon someone that you love, but you certainly subject upon yourself. I think it comes down to awareness, Tom. Like, but, but I, I don't want to let go of this, the notion of fucking rock bottom. Like, is there another way? I want there to be another way yeah, so I, badly. I, th I think it's awareness, right? I think one component here is awareness. And uh, let me explain what I mean by that. So my contention is that many of us, including myself, particularly in the past, maybe I'm still doing it on certain things, I'm walking around unconscious to what is really going on. Like, I think the way I am now is it's just simply the way I am. This is my personality. Now, one option is to hit adversity, right? Where something so tragic, something so painful happens that you start to look at things in a different way, mm -hmm. right? But this, and this is what drives me in my work that I do, in the books that I write, in my podcast. This is what drives me. I think it's storytelling, right? Storytelling. We're, we're in alignment there. Yeah, but storytelling is arguably the most powerful way to impact people. So do you mean self narrative or do you mean stories, books, TV shows, movies? I mean, self narrative. I mean, telling people stories on your, like what you do on this show, what you do on your YouTube channel, what I do on my podcast, right? You talk to people. And if let's say you're talking to someone who has gone through that journey and they share their emotions and as they reflect how they act in a certain situations, People will hear that and they will go, hey, wait a minute, you know, that's me actually in that situation. Hey, hey, like today, someone might go, you know what, I, I'm that person who doesn't own his name and feels like I don't want to offend people. Mm -hmm. So maybe they don't need to wait for them to get sick or one of their parents to die. Maybe somebody will listen to that and go, wait a minute, and now he's free from that. And okay, I, I'm going to go down that road. I'm going to start that process. Awareness is key, right? Awareness is absolutely key because most of us are, in my view, we are unaware. We are walking around with the blindfolds on in terms of what is really going on. And just to be clear, I am not criticizing people. I was that person. But when you can see the light, when you can see what truly is going on, I think that starts this long period of growth. I don't think it's quick. I don't think it's easy. I think it's a hard journey to go down but I think it's the most fulfilling journey to go down. So yes, I think there's another way. I don't, you necessarily need adversity, although I think it helps. And I guess this is what challenges me as a father, right? One of the big things that challenges me is this. I feel that I have grown and learned things about myself more from the difficult things that happen in my life than the good things. No question. So then the question is, as a parent, you want to protect your kids. You want them to have great experiences. But I also know that it's the bad stuff that can shape us. How do you do this? Th this is I don't know, man. This I'm is top to three reasons I don't have kids. Yeah. Like I, when I stop and think about what makes for an extraordinary human being, it is an unending parade of fucking misery that that person somehow overcomes. Now here's the problem. The misery breaks most of the people that it touches. So like when I think about life, man, the school of hard knocks, the school of hard knocks kicks the shit out of most people and they never recover and they never do anything interesting and their life is, is a certain level of suffering. And some people though, are able to internalize that and go, whoa, there's something really powerful here. I'm gonna learn from this, I'm gonna grow and I'm going to get better. And I really wanna believe that there's this 
awareness now around growth mindset that is really shifting a tide and that enough people are growing up and they're not falling prey to that trap because they're hearing about it. And you talked about your mission being born of your son. And it, while mine is clearly not born of my son, I have a mission that fills me with an equal amount of passion, which is I want to make sure that nobody reaches adulthood without encountering a growth mindset. Like just to know that it exists. And for me growing up, I didn't know that it existed. So I didn't have a mental model. It's like Roger Bannister in the four minute mile until you know that yeah. it's possible. Like you just, you, you can't conceptualize it. But this is the point I'm trying to make some about awareness. Awareness is key. And if you are unaware, you can't make those changes. If you don't know what growth mindset is, you know, how can you develop one, mm. right? And I think, I, I do think things are shifting in the world. I do think there is a growing awareness of all this stuff. I think the internet is a big part of that. You know, we are sharing ideas now. You've got this platform. I've got a platform. We're sharing these ideas. People will hear this stuff and it is changing their lives. You will get messages just as I do on your DMs in terms of, oh man, I heard that last interview. I get it now. I've, I, you know, I've done A, B and C now in my life because mm. of that. Isn't that the most awesome thing in the world on an individual level that we get to touch people by sharing these stories? The, the thing I would come back to is if I think about those episodes that I have recorded, like with, with Gabor Mate, for example, mm. that is quite poignant. It is quite, if you are not ready for it, it can rub you up the wrong way. Ooh. So why? How? How? So what happens, right? What does he say? Well, I think he's one of the most compassionate human beings I've come across. So I don't see how necessarily it can rub somebody up the wrong way. But if you are so entrapped with your own stories, right? If you cannot see out that side, if you have an identity that is built up around being a certain way, it can be too challenging. Is he saying like, stop playing the victim? What, no, what are his, you know what? what are the things that would rub somebody the wrong way? that any addictive tendency you have is rooted in childhood trauma. That is a pretty controversial statement for a lot of people. Having said that, he, and I think the word trauma- Because what, people wanna say this is a genetic disorder? Yeah, or they wanna say, you know, my, my childhood was great. I had a great childhood. What do you mean trauma? You know, I, nothing bad has happened to me. But the way he displays it, the way he explains it is, I think there's real compassion there. And I, I saw him speak live in London the day before I interviewed him. And he basically, at the end of his talk, he asked the audience, does anybody here think that um, they have got an addiction that was not rooted in childhood trauma, right? Um, I'm on the edge of my seat. Right? And, and so a few people put their hand up. It took a while, but you know, there's a couple of hands go up. So he went to someone at the front and he said, look, um, before we go down this path, are you open to sharing uh, and are you open to me asking you a few questions in front of this audience? She goes, yeah, no problem. Really confident. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And so he goes, so how was your childhood? Really, really good. Were you loved by your parents? Absolutely. Right, really kind of 110% answers. <laughs> My childhood was great. Anyway, she, he, he kept probing away. This took two minutes maximum. And then it turned out that he, he started asking about her relationship with her parents. And then she said, yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, my parents were so in love. I often felt that I was a spare part and I was getting in the way. And the whole audience, you could tell, we all took a, like a deep breath. I mean, it was so clear from the outside, mm. bingo. And so he honed in on that. And he made a supposition that uh, maybe your various addictions, maybe the way you are now is born out of that experience where you feel that you are getting in the way, that actually you are a burden on your parents. You are getting in the way of their love. He did it in such a masterfully, beautifully, compassionate way, right? And she did turn around and she did accept it. And she did start to, you could tell the, the tone of her voice changed. She, what was happening? She was being shown awareness. He gave her that awareness. Now, mm. I don't know what's happened to her. I don't know if she's oh, gone God, down that I journey. follow up. Ron, again, I want to follow up with this woman. I need to know where she's at, man. Yeah. Because th this kind of thing is, is like, okay, when people have a breakthrough like that, are they able to transform that into something that is permanent? So when you think about like habit formation, so this is where I often butt heads with people that take an entirely what I'll call spiritual or woo-woo approach to making real change in your life. 
Breakthroughs like that are extraordinary. But if that, because they give you the awareness, they now she has a framework with which to reevaluate her life and maybe the wound that she is seeking to fill with the addiction or whatever. Okay, super helpful. Now, moving forward, how, what is the process for making sure that somebody then goes down the path of gaining the understanding of how to make the actual changes that you want in life? Because normally what happens is the psychological immune system kicks in. She's now feeling raw and vulnerable. She does not like that feeling. And when there's not the sort of hype, and in fact, I would be surprised if she didn't later have, I, I, don't, I don't know her, but one potential, back. yeah, one potential sort of, response that would be either the family's like, what are you crazy? And then she's like, yeah, maybe that was crazy. Or she wakes up in the middle of the night and is like, oh my God, I can't believe that whole audience thinks that my parents didn't love me because they loved each other so much. And like begins to unwind this. I have seen that so many times where you think, oh my God, this person has had this amazing transformational breakthrough, but they simply can not be open to the fact that there is, they're doing something wrong. It is hard. I wish I could give you a simple answer <laughs> and say, oh no, you do A, B, and C and you will be okay. It is hard because I think this lady was maybe, I'm gonna guess late 40s, early 50s. That is many years of developing these shields yes. around her, developing these behavioral patterns, right? I think awareness is key. Is awareness enough? I don't think awareness is enough. I don't think everyone with awareness will do something with it. Mm. But I think without awareness, you've got very little, if not zero chance. How do you get people who don't want to work out to start working out? You So simplicity, that's one of your tricks. You've told the story of the couple in their 60s that started doing the yeah. workout at the top of the stairs and all that. And then they started good doing memory. it like seven days a week. And yeah. so how do you make that stuff stick? Or do you just tell everybody and some people do it and some don't? No, I personalize my approach depending on who the person is. I try and find, so one-on-one -on -one, it's easier than clearly if you're trying to deal with a lot of people or trying to give a message that's gonna work for a whole population. One-on-one, -on -one, I will listen very, very carefully to what a patient is telling me. I will pick up, to, I will try and pick up on these non-verbal signals. What is their pain point? What is their trigger point? What matters to them? And then I will try and frame the next steps around that. Do you do move towards techniques or move away? Meaning uh, you don't want to die of heart disease or you want to look good in that bikini? Again, I don't want to evade the question, but it depends. There's no universal. It, it, because I found one thing, you know, how long have I been seeing patients for now? Nearly 20 years, right? There is no one right way that works for every single person. So where I think lifestyle gets so important is Sometimes, and you mentioned that couple in their 60s who do this now, this 10 minute strength body weight workout every night while their bath runs upstairs. We've, we've spoken about this before. Why is that so important? It is not them going on this huge personal self growth journey, but what it is, it's starting to help them get in tune with their bodies, right? It's helping to develop a bit of self awareness. And without that self awareness, you are never going to get there, right? So I think sometimes even these small steps that people take are, they're starting to show themselves a bit of self-respect. They're starting to help themselves feel complete. Oh, I can do this. I didn't think that I was good enough to strength train. I didn't think I was the kind of person who could work out. Well, hold on a minute. Now you've been doing it every day for six months. I, hey, I'm the person, I'm the kind of person who works out. You know, I feel good. It's like, I've got more energy. I can see the tone of my body improve. This feels great. What else can I achieve? So this is why I'm so passionate about small things do make a difference. Small things, when done consistently, lead to bigger and bigger things. And so I think it is possible for everyone to grow and everyone to make change. But I think the path by which you get there is different for everyone. And look, I, uh, if you think about a graph, for me to go on this journey, I've had dips along the way. I've had times when I thought, you know, it is, hey, if you go on this journey and your other half does not, that is hugely challenging. I'm very lucky. My wife is on her journey like I am on my journey and we have got this uh, deep commitment that we are committed to self-growth ourselves and we're committed to be together as well. Mm. Even if sometimes it makes it challenging because if one of you is changing at a different rate compared to the other one, it can. What do you do when you're in that circumstance? This is so interesting to me. 
what do you do? I'm a lot better at dealing with it now than I was a few years ago, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, hey, a few years ago, it would lead to rows, right? We, it, we Arguments would for the US audience. Arguments, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it would, um, yeah, we, it would blow up and, you know. Because somebody's feeling judged. Yeah, someone's feeling judged. And one thing I've learned on all this stuff is when we're judging someone else, we're really judging ourselves. And again, these things sound super spiritual. No, no, no. This, right? this is money. I think the, this a lot is of people genuinely with this. what I think is ultimately the key to good health. If I'm honest, if I'm truly honest, relationships specifically, growing, no, growing as a person, understanding who you are, right? Finding out who you are without all the programming from everyone around you. I think it's the only journey worth taking. If you ask me, what is the point of life, right? Because I reflect on this a lot. I think the point of life is simply to figure out who you are. To f- I'm going to push you on that. Yeah, so push away. You brought this up earlier. You default to the words, figure out who you are, but then you once followed it up by saying, and change elements if you want. To me, it isn't necessarily that interesting to find out who you are other than to know where the starting line is. And then to me, it's a question of who do you want to become? Like, what do you want to develop? What aspects of your personality do you respect? What aspects of your personality do you not respect? And then be able to change and shape those accordingly. Do you see it like that? Or do you see it as, no, 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 this is about recognizing an immutable truth about who you are. And at least now you know. I think it's both because I think what it is, is it's the process of understanding who you are I think leads to all the gold in life, right? I think it leads to the passion. I think it leads to you achieving things. Why do you say that? That does not sound true to me. Why does it not sound true? Because I think most people don't have passion. And I think clearing out their head of all other people's judgments about things that they may like and all that will be tremendously beneficial. But to me, passion seems to be the result of a process. It does not seem to be an archeological dig. It is, uh, it's about building something, it's architecture. So when I think about, like every time you've said it in this interview, because one time you said, and then you can make changes if you want, I've just sort of said, all right, I'll assume he means as like a starting line, a starting line, a starting line. Mm-hmm. But discovering who you are implies an intrinsic immutable nature and i think that who you are is based on yes for sure your wiring we are not blank slates i do not think that i'm fucking fascinated by stephen pinker's book blank slate which basically hammers home the fact that we come with a whole lot of wiring so hey fair enough there is some amount of like your personality is just going to be different you have two kids right two kids so i'm sure they're very different in temperament and 100 yeah so every parent says that me and my sister oh my god for all the things that we have in common like we are very different people so i fully understand that there's a certain amount of hardwiring and and as a starting point for my sister to understand how she's going to react to certain things or for me to understand how I'm going to react to certain things is very beneficial as a starting line. But then going beyond that, I think that there are the one constant of the human animal is our ability to adapt. So now my question just becomes for anybody, like who do you want to become? Like if you understand how the mind can change, if you don't have a passion, which is probably the number one question that I get asked, don't panic, you can develop one. If you don't like an aspect of your personality, you can change it. You talked earlier about identity. I think a lot of this comes down to, you were saying that I'm the type of person who works out. You know, I didn't think I was, but here I am. I've been doing it for six months. Like that's all grabbing a hold of your identity and saying, like the staircase example could have just as easily gone, no, 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 we're gonna practice. Every day you're gonna come and see me and for an hour, we're gonna talk about what a badass you are in the gym, but I'm not gonna let you work out. You're going to imagine, you're gonna visualize, you're gonna tell me what a badass you are. You're gonna go tell other people. And then a month later, I'm gonna let you actually go in the gym. And then I think that that person, while certainly won't be guaranteed, I think they're more likely to have success because they've done all the work in their, their identity, their mindset, their belief system, their values, all of that. But that's all malleable. It is malleable. I guess what I'm saying is that because I feel that many of us are walking around unconscious, We don't actually know what our true passion is. Let's say you do think- Because you think it's everyone has a true passion that's lying dormant. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this. If you don't know who you truly are, 
what you think your passion or you know the things you like doing what your does hobbies it mean to be someone that might be we may just i may be misunderstanding your definition so when you say who you are what does that mean so i'm clearly influenced in my conversation at the moment because i'm going through a lot at the moment right so i'm going through this path so i'm constantly shifting like if we had this conversation six months ago, it would be different from the mm. way we're having it today, right? So things are changing all the time. So things in your identity, beliefs, values, yeah, what? who I am. I, I mean, I could share some of those things with you. What has even changed on this trip to LA, for example, Ooh. right? So I feel that as the weeks go by, I am understanding more about who I am. And therefore the decisions I am taking are now different. What I used to think was a passion is no longer a passion. I'll give you an example. Yes, please. Right. I used to be a huge football or just soccer. to be clear, soccer fan. Okay. So, you know, I grew up in South Manchester, right? Soccer is the predominant game in the UK. It is the national sport, right? My older brother supported Manchester United. So I rebelled against that and I supported Liverpool. Now, when I say supported, let's be really clear. I was obsessed. <laughs> I went to the games. I would check all the transfer speculation seven days a week. If we lost, I would get upset. When I was old enough to, and I was earning money, I would fly around Europe to watch Liverpool play, Whoa. right? If I was at a friend's wedding and Liverpool playing, I would want to sneak out to see if I could catch some of it. Let's put that in perspective. I was all in with football. My friends would have said, what, what, what are Rangan's hobbies? Oh man, he loves football. He loves Liverpool Football Club. Why? Fast forward now, where I don't pay attention to anything that is going on in football. Wow. Now, what's going on there? What's going on there? Because I've thought about this a lot. I think that what happens, like many teenagers, you were trying to fit in, right? I can only express my own experience. Being an immigrant, living, living in an immigrant family in the UK, where I've got an Indian culture at home, and when I go to school, all my friends, all my buddies have a Western culture. Mm. So you kind of almost have these two personalities, your home personality and your school personality, right? So I think that I developed this passion for football as a way of fitting in, as a way of defining who I was. It was my identity. I am a Liverpool Football Club fan. I get upset when we lose. I'm going to show you how much I care about this team, right? What's happened over the last few years? I don't give two hoots anymore. <laughs> what happens? Now, that was a gradual process in the sense that as I started to find myself, as I started to strip away the layers, as I started to become calmer and more at peace with who I am, actually, I no longer had that desire anymore. I'm not trying to please other people. Was it replaced by something? Like, did you suddenly realize, I've actually always been into video games, swimming, basket weaving like i think there's multiple things that could be going on here this has also clashed with me being a parent right so my time has suddenly got limited mm -hmm. in a way that it wasn't before and my view now is that you know i'm so busy as is everybody do i want to spend my free time watching 22 people on a pitch play and start to raise my stress <laughs> level to something i have zero control over I don't want to hang out with my kids or go for a walk with my wife or do something for me. So I think that's one component. I don't but think you could have indoctrinated them and made it like a whole big thing for you and your kids. It's interesting. I've I know, never and I have it. So my right. son does not support the same team as me, right? And my friends are like, "Did you? How, can, how, how have you allowed this to happen? I said, hey, you know what? I don't want to program my son to all the stuff that I... I've done, it's changed. this journey has changed the way I parent. I feel I'm a calmer, I feel I'm a less judgmental parent now than possibly I was before. I feel I'm in a much better way able for my, ch my child, my children to express themselves the way they want to express themselves. Have they said anything? No. The, do, do you think they notice or are they too young? Well, my son is now getting to that age where all his buddies are into soccer. So now we're talking about it and I am trying to get back into it so I can, interact with my son, but we, I just, I'm just not interested, mm. right? So when I say you will start to find your passions, right? What I mean by that is, and I guess we're looking at passion from a slightly different perspective. I'm simply saying that if you don't fully know who you are, okay, I think it's very hard to know what it is you truly want. So 
I get so much satisfaction these days. Like, I love my life, right? I don't mean that to sound like a dick, right? I say that because I genuinely do. Like, I love the career I've got. I love the fact that I get to help people, that I get to write books, record podcasts with really cool people. So I get a lot of growth from it, but then I also get to share this thing and help inspire hundreds of thousands of people. I love it, right? So I would you say I've replaced following a football team for having a career that I'm super stoked about? I'm not sure it's that straightforward that I've replaced it with something else. I just feel now I'm not trying to be someone who I'm not anymore. I don't think I am anyway. I feel I'm now more in touch with actually what it is I want. Like what it is, you know, I'm not into this whole third person piece where you you talk about yourself, but like how one might talk about themselves. I'm thinking, but you know, what does Rongan Chatterjee (laughs) want, right? Not what does he think he wants. And so... I'm not sure. Not what you think you want or not what you think you should want? Both. Both. You know? Did you ever have unease around football? Like, was it a thing where you're like, oh, God, I've kind of backed myself into a corner, but why the fuck am I flying to see this team? Unease. I wouldn't say about that. I remember in 2007. So in 2005, Liverpool got to the Champions League final. I flew to Istanbul for the day from the UK to watch it. It was, you know, regarded as one of the best finals of all time. Liverpool were 3-0 down at half time, thought they were done. You know, the whole crowd starts singing, inspires the team. They come back to 3-0 and win on penalties. At that time, that was probably the best moment in my entire life. <laughs> at that time, right? Sure. Two, two years later in 2007... We are also in the final again. I fly with my same buddy to Athens for the day to watch the final. What happens? I'm sitting in the Liverpool section with my buddy and things are not going well. Liverpool are losing. Suddenly, uh, this group of guys turn around and start screaming uh, racist abuse at me. Randomly? yeah, you know, I'm not going to repeat what they said and because that's so crazy. Your own supporters? Your own supporters. I had my shirt on. I was with my buddy who's a Caucasian guy, um, you know, to the point where we both felt super uncomfortable. That's so weird. And I had never, ever had that at a football game before. And so that could also be a slight trigger at the start of the end of my love affair with football because mm. I thought, and I've examined it, I thought, isn't this interesting? When things are going well, when the teams are winning, everything's great. But as soon as people start to get frustrated, they start to take it out on people. Mm. Um, so I didn't like the way that made me feel, for sure. We moved into a different part of the arena. So I don't think I've ever experienced any negativity apart from that, if I'm honest. So I have not tried to stop watching football. It just no longer fits with where I'm at at the moment. Mm. So, and that feels to you like you're discovering who you really are versus just evolving. Well, I think discovering who you really are is evolving. You know, maybe you could clarify. What do you mean by that exactly? I think what I'm saying is I look at us like we are a an, a chemical processing plant that shifts and changes how it responds to its environment based on its environment. So if you grow up as an immigrant in a foreign country, then you're going to have a very different um, frame of reference than you would if you didn't grow up in an immigrant family. So that's one way that you have a frame of reference. If you're not loved as a child, that creates another frame of reference. If you're bullied, that creates a frame of reference. If you grow up poor, frame of reference, rich, frame of reference. So all of these things give you a different perspective with which to view the world. Now, none of them are the real you. There's no real you. Oh, you grew up rich and that's the real you. There's no grew up poor and that's the real you. But I think those people would come out very different. So we were talking about how kids um, are wildly impacted by adversity. Okay, so is that kid fundamentally themselves when they're facing adversity or fundamentally themselves if they're not facing adversity? I don't think there is sort of a fundamental self. I think that there are we come with wiring. Everybody is different. I think you do have sort of a baseline personality. I think it would be useful to understand like where you're going to struggle versus somebody else. 
Um, for instance, I find it while I am introverted, I find it very easy to put on my extroverted hat. So I'm an ambivert. Now other people, my sister, for instance, is wildly extroverted. So it is like useful for us to know sort of our, our, what we're like in our idling state. But when I think about even what I was like 10 years ago, it's radically different than I am now. But back then felt back then I would say was authentically me but there were problems that I had not addressed yet. And now I feel like I'm authentically me, but for sure I'm better than I was 10 years ago in terms of my ability to stay emotionally calm and centered. Things that I'm pursuing are different. And 10 years from now, I will be radically different, but I don't believe any of them were um, me laboring under um, a false sense of identity, even though some states were suboptimal in terms of my ability to enjoy my life. I think my journey was absolutely defined by false states of identity. And I guess that's where this passion about this comes from is because I can now reflect back and go, yeah, sure, that felt authentic to me at the time. I didn't feel I was faking it, right? I didn't, I thought that was me. And you could argue, right? And I probably can't disagree that on one level, is this just a natural consequence of getting older, right? Is this just what happens as you develop more life experience? I'm not convinced it is because I think you can grow older, become wiser, um, change, you know, not be as reactive in your 40s as you are in your 20s, you know, a bit more chilled about things. Sure, I think that happens to a lot of people. But I do think that when we stop looking for answers externally, when we start going internally, I think we start to figure out, you know, who we are, like, and, and there are many, potentially there are many versions of who you are, right? Maybe it's not just one thing. Maybe you can go down this path and come up with lots of different conclusions. I don't know. I'm still on the journey, right? So I don't know. If we do this chat in two years, maybe I've got something different to share. But at the moment, and I've got to say, if I take it back to the consultation room, with patients, right? Because that's one thing I've got a lot of experience in, tens of thousands of patients over many, many years. Yes, I'm a huge fan of lifestyle change, for sure. But I think that lifestyle change can be very limited for people. It can be very challenging for some people because there's underlying issues that are unresolved. And I find the people who really get true freedom from their health complaints, often, I'm not saying always, right? Because it's a very delicate area, but generally I find that they have taken, their mindset has shifted on some level. They have started to change certain patterns in their thinking, right? That can happen in many ways. You talk a lot about mindsets, right? Can you consciously just change your mindset? Potentially, right? But I think if you're consciously always trying to change something, there potentially is still a slight tension there because you're consciously trying to do it. I have found that when you strip away these layers, those changes often happen without you even trying. Without even trying to consciously change my mindset, those things move away. So I've always been a perfectionist, you, or you would consider me to be a perfectionist. I don't really think I am anymore. You know, I, 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 I certainly have that tendency. It's not because I'm no longer trying to be a perfectionist, but by doing the inner work, I no longer feel the need that everything I do has to be perfect, that I can't put anything out into the world until every little thing has been checked. So I think there are many ways to get there. But do you follow what I'm saying? I'm not convinced that it always has to be a conscious process. This is very intriguing to me. And do you I, disagree? I think I do. Okay. But, but here is the, I, I'm not yet sure how much it matters because you're obviously working your way to a beautiful place. And so I want to say that all of my words are predicated on, it's entirely possible this is just semantics. It's entirely possible that people listening at home are saying, oh my God, you guys basically agree and you're just missing this one variable. Um, well, I no don't doubt we will get told. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no doubt we will we, find we, out. We, we will hear, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think that you're coming at it from a fundamental place of, of what you just said, which is you believe in the stripping away and I believe in the building up or changing. So I think that like when I hear, actually, I, I won't tell you what I think. Do you think kids exist in um, this sort of idyllic state that the world 
um, twists and toxicifies? Or I, th I think it's I think that's too binary. I think there is some pre-programming that comes in. I think we know there's a lot of science around epigenetic imprinting that actually um, the stress from our ancestors, the stress from our parents can absolutely be programmed in and can change the way that we react to stress, the way we look at things in our own life. So I think there is a certain amount of pre-programming that comes for sure. But I also do think, which is relatively obvious uh, on some level, that the environment hugely shapes what then happens. Okay, so that we agree on radically. So I think that for sure there's a mixture of genetics, epigenetics, environment. So I think that the human animal is born to respond to its environment. That is what it does. Now, if you think about the responses to the environment being a shaping of the personality, I don't see where the sort of true personality comes in. Now, if you say, hey, People have given you beliefs that don't serve you. Then I would say, please define don't serve you. I will postulate, put forward, I think postulate is correct. I will put forward that what is going on is you have beliefs about the world, beliefs about yourself that lead you to a neurochemically disadvantaged state, meaning you just don't feel good. Something feels off, something doesn't feel right, whatever. That's why I was asking like, did you have a sense of unease about the football? Because I've been around people that um, love sports in a way that I do not. So I'm on the outside, I'm looking in, and I think, that's really interesting. You're, you're having a surrogate experience that takes you on this neurochemical roller coaster that is very similar to actually being out on the field playing. Now, I think somebody out on the field playing, nobody would say, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Why do they care about it? I mean, you could say that about almost any job that isn't like an MD where there's actual real life and death consequences. We hold athletes up as a celebration of human potential realized. So I think there is this desire to feel like you're a part of a team, to belong to something, to seek victory, to feel attached and like that victory is yours when they win, to feel the pain of defeat when they lose, to have this communal sense of ownership over that experience. I think all of that is innate to the human. So when people say that they're really passionate about sports, I say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense in terms of having a surrogate experience rather than actually playing it yourself, you're into it. So to me, loving it and then eventually not loving it is simply, eh, you're moving through like a continuum a continuum of the human experience. Not that, oh, this was, it was born of a desire to fit in. I get that. And I get how in that context, your makeup as a human being is telling you, not even that, a better way of saying it, you were designed to conform to your environment, to survive. That's yeah, what fucking humans sure. do. So you're born into that particular environment. Of course, you were going to do things that fit in, to fit in. And when you grow and change and your life changes and your environment changes, it, it makes sense to me that your likes and dislikes are going to change. Now, why do I press this point? The reason that I press this point, the reason that I think that it makes sense to stop and differentiate between the two worldviews is people listening right now, I want them to understand everything about your worldview, everything about your identity, everything about your values and beliefs, it's all made up. And it is a random artifact of that is what humans do, and that is the environment into which you were born. And so trying, so I'm, I'm literally writing a book about this right now. And I was trying to like explain to people, how do I get them to buy instantly into the fact that you are malleable, man. You are so malleable. I, I'll, I'll give me one more hey, second man, to finish I'm this not, out. No, no, that's fine. So you've got, if I take a kid and raise them in America, or I take that same, and let's make it nice and juicy. I take a girl and I raise her in America, or I take that same girl and I raise her in Afghanistan. They are going to be very different outcomes. Now, there'll be certain things that you would recognize if they were twins separated at sure. birth, like there would be certain things that they recognize, but their value systems would be unimaginably different. And when you think about that, that the same person, and you just raise them in different cultures, and they have different cultural beliefs, to the point where people go to war over the religions that they happen to be born into. So it's like, yo, if you can shape somebody's worldview to the point where they would kill and or die for that belief simply based on where they were raised, how they were indoctrinated, it's like, what sort of 
natural state are we trying to get people back to? That that presupposes in my um, estimation that kids are born perfect and the world then sort of torments them. And my thing is kids are born as an adaptation machine and they're essentially dumb and the culture fills them up, right? They, they can't even take care of themselves. They, yeah. they would get eaten. And so when I hear people talking about like a six-year-old and look at the way they fucking color and they get so into it, like I get it as a, a, a way for us to think about being in flow and to let go of the judgments and all that. But there is yet to be a six-year-old without a brain disorder that doesn't take in the input from their culture and morph and change to fit in and to pay attention and to think about how they work in the world and not work in the world. In fact, the kid that just colors and is totally divorced from the world around them and is in a constant state of flow, we would say they're autistic. So it's like, I, I don't think there is like, oh, you're born with this sort of innate... Um, beauty and goodness for being a human, and then it gets all fucked up. It does in some cases get all fucked up because you get the wrong identities, beliefs, values, blah, blah, blah. But it's like the goal is to go, not that I need to revert to some pure state. It's, oh, I see. Beliefs are malleable. Values are malleable. Identity is malleable. I need to change them into something that serves me and gives me what I will shorthand to fulfillment. Tom, I don't think I, I, I disagree with you. Right? I don't think actually what we're saying is as different as it potentially sounds. So I agree humans are malleable. I also agree that we have various belief systems that will depend on where we are, right? And those belief systems often will serve us at that time. So me feeling to take one incident where as a 12-year-old boy, I don't feel as though I fit in, right? I have morphed, I have adapted so that I do fit in you could make a case that that was fully appropriate. I did the right thing so that I belonged to a community, right? You, you can make that case. Maybe that served me to a point. Maybe the evolution is simply that it no longer serves me. There's a slight unease in my life after my father died. With the time that I had to self-reflect, there was unease in my life. That is also what drove me to try and figure this stuff out. It's like, why is there slight unease in what I'm doing? Why is there dis-ease in what I am doing? So I agree, it is evolution. It is trying to find out which behaviors, which identities that you have created, because I do also agree with you that it is in our heads. We create these identities. We can just as easily, if we choose to, create a different one, right? I don't think what we're saying is as dissimilar as potentially, I'm not saying you're trying to make out, because I think it's, I think it's a I think it's a valuable dive in. It's super interesting for me to try and figure this out and go, actually, is what we're saying as different as it might sound or is it actually the same thing? My mindset is changing, right? Maybe it's my, I think I've always had a growth mindset. I think I've always dr been driven to do the best at everything I do, to be as good as I can. So maybe that mindset, when I suddenly had the time, right? Post my dad, when I suddenly had the time, then I had the time to actually go, there is something not quite right here. I am always striving to learn. I'm always striving to get better. I want to get better at being me, right? That is the journey I've been on. And the way I have found to do that is to strip away layers, is to peel away at layers of the onion. And so when I say to find out who the real me is, maybe the real me living in the UK traveling for a week's promo in LA, maybe this is the me that serves me in this environment. Maybe if I lived in Afghanistan, my journey to find out who the real me would be would actually be a different version of me because I would have to find the me I was comfortable with in that environment. So I actually think there is similarity to what we're saying, but I guess maybe I'm articulating in a slightly different way from how you would articulate it. If it is about tools that we can pick up, if it is about changing our mindset, let's say we've got lots of compensations. Um, compensations, I can, I, can, I, can, I can frame that better. If we've got lots of behaviors that have been appropriate responses to the experiences we've had, but we work on our mindset, we take some of the tools that you're teaching all the time to work on our mindsets. As we do that, I think the natural consequence of that will be that we will start to re-examine some of our belief systems. So I think there are many paths to get to the same place, and I don't think it's one or the other. I think people will figure out what works for them. 
I'm sharing very openly my journey. I have seen this also work for many, many patients. I've looked after people with chronic, chronic health complaints. And when their mindset shifts, when they start to see some of the programming that they've had to view the world a certain way, and when that starts to shift and they see where that has come from, then I see this truly wonderful growth. And I think I'm influenced by my own experience. I'm influenced by seeing patients and what I find works in real life for people who are struggling. But you also have experience. You also, you know, you share your rules, the rules that you have there, what you feel about mindset. I think there are many ways to get to that. What, what, what is that place? That place is where we feel, we feel good. We have that inner sense of calm. We're very comfortable with what we're doing in the world, with who we are. We, we like where we fit in. We, we know where we fit into the world around us, to that particular environment in which we currently reside. You know, if I move, as I've said already, if I move to Mexico, right, maybe the way I am would have to change again. Maybe the real me in Mexico is the different real me from Manchester. I, I believe that there are fundamental similarities that will be there. You know, I feel... I worry that, like, as adults, we don't have the level of, like, fundamental change that we would as a kid. I am, I am, this is something people that listen to me have heard me say many times. I'm deeply distressed by how much of our imprinting happens when we're young. And so, like, as you're talking about that and you're talking about would the real you be different in Mexico? Probably not. I, I mean, like, the, the, so if I were to step to your position but use language that, I understand better maybe the right way to say it because I think you're right. Like I can feel that th this, if we were functionally to like work in the same space, I don't think there would be much difference in terms of how we perceive it, but I think we would explain things very differently. Agreed. Um, when I think about the truth of what you're saying, what I think to is the importance of stillness, the importance of silence, the ability to what I'll just round to meditation and how powerful that is when there's no noise, when you're not judging yourself, when you're not allowing other people's judgments to cloud your vision, um, to have the awareness of your own emotional, your internal emotional states so that you can really begin to suss out what you um, respond to. So I'll say that a, a passion for me I don't think is uncovered, but I do think it begins as an interest. And if you can't hear that interest because you're shutting it down and you're saying, oh, I shouldn't be interested in that or whatever, then certainly people are never able to discover that they're never able to um i was going to bring this up earlier biofeedback is something that um at one point in my life ended up being insanely powerful because i could not internally get in touch with a certain part of my mid back and it was causing all kinds of problems when i lifted weights and so i went to see a physiotherapist and he said oh you have th these two parts of your mid back that are just insanely weak compared to the rest of your back. And he was like, here, try to fire it. And he was touching it. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking yeah. about, dude. It feels so weird. And so he put these biofeedback devices on my back so that when I fired the muscle, it would beep. And when I began, I couldn't fire it. And it was basically silent. And then by, I don't know, whatever, two months later or something, I could make them sound like a machine gun going off. And it was so crazy to see how by getting that external feedback, because I couldn't, for whatever reason, I couldn't get it internally, by getting the external feedback, then I was able to find the connection inside, and that ended up being incredibly powerful. So people that aren't able to hear themselves, they aren't able to get to that point to learn to do that, what I think you're calling stripping away the layers of other people's influence, or at least having the awareness of how you developed a belief so that if you know, ah, this belief was developed because I wanted to fit in, ah, my obsession with football actually began with something else, okay, now I have this sort of awareness path of how these things became hardwired, do I want to change them? And if I do, at least now seeing their construction, you can't unsee it. And so now once you see it as a construction, then you can really begin to make the change. Like I get that's me using my own language. No, but you've just, you just, the phrase which really got it for me there is when you see that it is a construction, then you can start to unconstruct it, right? right? I think fundamentally that is what we are both talking about. 100%. We're talking about awareness. And just as the environment shapes us, 
your upbringing, your experience in business, the people you interact with will probably shape the way you have found to articulate that. My own experience, me, you know, I'm not in business. I, my job is seeing people wh where they come in with problems. So I have developed a way to explain this to people in a language that I feel and I have seen resonate with them, mm. right? So maybe it's your background, uh, you know, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but maybe it's you've got a business background. I don't. I've got a seeing patients background. So maybe the way we're going to articulate these ideas is inherently going to be different because we have got different language and different um, experiences through which we are trying to explain this. Because I don't think, you know, as you're describing the way you see it, I'm sort of in agreement, right? Maybe I'm not particularly good at explaining. No, 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 you're great. And, and, it and could I be certainly don't want this to be uh, this versus that. It It is... But it is a construction, man. That's the point. It is a construction. Yes. I, it, you can strip everything away and say, the story goes like this. My dad died. I now have time. With that time, I started to self-reflect. I realized that many of the things, many of my behaviors were constructed behaviors. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Now that I've seen it, I'm going to start stripping them away. That is the way I would summarize the whole journey. It can be that simple. Mm. Now, how you unconstruct those layers, how you decide once you have that awareness to start building a new identity, if that's what you want, or new beliefs, new you know, new belief systems, whatever it is, there, I believe there are multiple ways to get there. I think there are so many different tools and techniques people can use. Um, you know, you know, people can read a book and they can read like your lessons and they go, right, I'm gonna apply this framework in my life. For many people, that will get them there. Speaking of books, let's talk about the stress solution. What made you want to write this particular book? I've heard a phrase that authors often write the books that they need to write for mm. themselves. And I think there's a very, very strong case for that. Um, the, the reason that I think I wrote the book is A, it's out of these four pillars that I talk about, food, movement, sleep, and relaxation. The relaxation piece is the one I struggle with. Mm. It's the piece that when I was promoting my first book and going around the country and abroad talking about this, people would say, that is the pillar I struggle with the most. So consistently, I was hearing that this stress piece is what people are struggling with. And I wrote the book because I felt that when we talk about health and well-being, I think diet and movement gets all the attention, mm -hmm. right? I think it usurps all the press, column inches, uh, all the books. It's all about food and movement. Now, those are clearly important. I am not for one minute <laughs> saying they are not important. But I think potentially we have overemphasized those at the expense of chronic unrelenting stress. Now, stress can be a very toxic word. You have to define what you mean by it. You know, what... Stress itself is a toxic word? I think for some people. Like it's a trigger because they feel guilty? I don't understand that. Yeah, a lot of people don't like the words. Like they don't want to be, what I mean by that is a toxic word in the sense that um, I don't want to hear about stress. I don't think I am stressed. The amount of patients, for example, who I have seen where you try and bring up the word stress, it comes up with a barrier straight away. You know, I'm not stressed. You know, stress is not an issue. Um, oh, I understand what you're saying, but that doesn't affect me. I'm totally cool with my life, right? And so I think the word stress in itself can be problematic for some people. But just to put this in uh, perspective, Tom, the World Health Organization calls stress the health epidemic of the 21st century, right? That is there on their website even today, the health epidemic of the 21st century. Wow. I think that is a pretty remarkable statement from a very big global organization. Research suggests that up to 90% of what a doctor like me sees in any given day is in some way related to stress. The thing I found so um, cap captivating in the book is the part about relationships. That was the part I didn't expect. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about um, some of your views on, I, I think, I'm getting pretty close to a paraphrased quote here, that sex doesn't even necessarily have to be about romance. 
And I've got to imagine you get some pushback on that. So one, what is the, the, talk to me a little bit about some of the declining sex rates that you've talked about, the increase in virginity. Do you know about Japan? What about Japan? They're, they have the lowest fertility rate of any industrialized nation in history. And that they have like 10%, I think, virginity rates in the mid 30s, which is crazy. They're expecting in the next uh, century for their population of Japan to get cut in half and have at they, current rates. Has anyone speculated what is going on? Well, it, it reminded me so much of what you write about in the book that yes. So there's um, part of it is technology, part of it is stress, crazy, crazy. I mean, Japan is like famous yeah, yeah. for people working until they die at their desk. I know. So. I'll chalk it up to that technology, cultural differences. Um, yeah. I didn't know about this in Japan. Okay. That's news. Your, your book is so on point with it. So even just going off of what you talked about in the book, you're, you're right on the money. Look, there are many things that can cause infertility. There are many things that can cause a low libido, right? But to really simplify this, what is your stress response there to do? Right. So to keep you safe. It gets activated when you perceive that you are in danger. Okay, your listeners will know all this. Two million years ago, you're in your hunter-gatherer tribe. You're getting about going about your business. A wild predator is approaching. Suddenly, in an instant, your stress response gets activated. Right? Various things happen in your body. Your blood sugar goes up, so more glucose can get to your brain. Your amygdala, your emotional brain goes on to high alert so that you are hyper vigilant for all the threats around you, okay? That is an appropriate response. Your blood pressure goes up, appropriate response. Your blood becomes prone to clotting so that if that lion attacks you, mm. you don't bleed to death. That is fundamentally what your stress response is there to do, right? The problem now is that it's our lives that are activating our stress response, not wild predators. That I think we understand. But as well as the things that it prioritizes, when you're in danger, when you are stressed, what are the things it switches off? Well, it switches off your digestion, which is one of the main reasons why so many of us, 80% of the UK population in any given year have a digestive complaint, right? 80%? 80% the last survey said, 80%. And again, we always talk about food when we talk about digestion, and clearly that is a component. But I contend that stress is a bigger component than food when it comes to digestive disturbances. I have patients wow. who, are, many patients now complain that they are intolerant to certain foods, right? Mm -hmm. Go on. And they are, you know, they have a reaction when they eat a certain foods. I'm coming back to libido in a minute. This is a slightly <laughs> roundabout way of getting there, but you do say we're doing long form. Hey, hey, let's do it. So let's do it. So I have found in the last few years that somebody who actually is reacting to a certain food it is not the food. So when I have taught them about the stress response and mm -hmm. taught them how that they can switch it off before they eat. Tell me, because this almost certainly is something Lisa struggles with, and we'll get back to libido. We'll get back but. to libido. <laughs> but I found now that a certain section of my patient population no longer react to the foods that they previously did. What do you did. have them do? Man, it is simple. Like everything I recommend in the book, it is simple, right? We've overcomplicated this whole industry around wellness and health and stress. Breathing, right? It's simply, I've got a multiple load of breathing techniques. There's a breathing menu in the book. I get people to choose one, but the one I like a lot that my patients seem to really respond well to is something I call the three, four, five breath. When you breathe in for three, you hold for four, and you breathe out for five. Now, yeah. To do that one cycle takes 12 seconds. You do that five times, it takes one minute. Many of my patients, I have them do that for one minute before they eat. So this is to try and break the cycle of us going at 100 miles an hour, sending our emails, sending our texts. Oh, I've got to eat. I'm going to buy my uh, healthy whole food organic lunch, but I'm going to eat it whilst I'm also getting back to these emails. And I'm, hey man, I do this, right? I am not criticizing when people do this. I am susceptible to this. Do people hit you with that a lot? What? The, like, I'm not criticizing? Yeah. Because I've said it so many times in this interview. Yeah. Because I, I would say, fucking criticize. For, you want to help, for sure. But, yeah, I wouldn't be, well, I wouldn't I, be bashful. I, people are I, doing stuff that's fucking them up. I would say that this is still a hangover from these behavioral patterns and identities that mm. I'm trying to shake off. 
right? About not wanting to offend, right? right? Wanting to be the one who actually everyone likes, right? I'm, I can be honest about this. I think I'm hoping if we have this chat in two years' time, I'm hoping I'm not doing that anymore. You're going to grab the mic and be like, all right, motherfuckers. This is my show. how it's going to be. Uh, yeah. No, do you know what I mean? But, <laughs> Dude, but, but, totally. But if I'm, com- if I'm completely honest, this is, this is probably something I've not quite managed to let go yet. Yeah, yeah, right? I get it. So, um, yeah, but it, I have noticed I've said that quite a lot today. I don't want people. And also, it is also comes from a place of compassion where I know that these tools are going to help people because I see it day in, day out. So right. I would like people not to think, oh, God, you are, you're whiter than white. What you what? You never actually um, eat your healthy lunch whilst also yeah. sending emails. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, no, I am human. I right, do sure. it as well. Just because I know what one should be doing doesn't mean I always do it. But to come back to what I've seen with patients is sometimes patients who feel that they are suffering and are intolerant to a certain food, what I've realized is by doing that before they eat, by slowing down before they eat, by shutting the laptop, going to a different room, actually changing the way that they're thinking, suddenly they're no longer reacting to the same food. Mm. And man, I've only figured this out in the last couple of years, right? So this has been a revelation to me that, oh man, in the past, I was asking them to eliminate that food for a while. Now, I still do need to do that sometimes, but I'm figuring out, wait a minute, it makes sense. When you look at fundamentally what the stress response is, if you are stressed, right, and your stress will be different from my stress, you will switch off digestion. It is not essential to survival. Therefore, maybe that is why you're reacting to that food. If you can activate, if you can switch off the stress response, promote relaxation, then suddenly maybe you're not gonna to react to the same food. It could be a five minute walk, right? It could be that Lisa, before she eats, and again, I don't know the ins and outs of what's going on, but maybe it is not going straight from work to food. Maybe mm-hmm. it's about going outside for five minutes, chilling out. Um, hey, what, what do the French do, right? What do the French do? They're known for their long lunches, right? It is not, you do not, by and large, and I spoke to some people from Paris recently and say in the urban settings in offices as there's an international workforce coming in, things are starting to change. Mm-hmm. But still, it is a core part of French culture. We don't mess around with our lunch break is lunch break, right? Book down, pen down. We are chilling now and we are going to enjoy our lunch, right? There is this whole thing called the French paradox. Why can the French apparently eat so many what we would consider unhealthy foods, yet apparently not suffer from the consequences. I think more and more this is a big part of the picture. I think the way they eat is as important as what they eat. And I don't feel that we in the West take that seriously enough. We talk about food, we talk about what are you eating? Yeah, I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire for a second. I think earlier you said it's more important than what they eat. So if you had to rank order them, I know you don't want to, but, but you're going to push order. me. I'm going to push you. What or how? Which is, which how? has a, really? Yeah. Wow. If you push me now yeah, and yeah. how I view myself and how I view this today from what I've seen in my clinical practice, I actually now believe that how you eat is just more important wow. than what you eat. So let's, and we are And that's because you are pushing me. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, look, I, I think they're both they're important. For I'm sure. not saying All four eat pillars junk. Are important. Right. I'm not saying be chilled out <laughs> and eat junk food, right? You can have a Snickers as long as you relax. Uh, no, I get that. So if um, somebody were going to do it the like just absolutely perfect way, what would a meal look like? They sit down, they do the three, four, five breathing for a minute. Yeah, look, if that, if that floats your boat, if that appeals to you, and I appreciate it, it doesn't to everyone. So easy to you is more important than anything. Yeah, because that is the patient population I see. Busy right. people with busy lives who tell me they don't have time to do all this fancy wild stuff. What if somebody's, I, I'm asking for a friend. What if somebody's <laughs> super diehard and they're willing to do whatever? What would be the... I would say you want to, your nervous system has two states. The stress state and the relaxation state. Yep. Very, very simplistically. You want to make sure you're eating in a relaxed state, right? How you do that depends on how much stress you've accumulated in the morning, what's going on in your life. But a very simple tool would be have some form of switch, something where you, sh- you shift from work mode to relaxation mode. You know, go for a walk for five minutes, do would some deep walking, breathing. like moving, is that a critical component or uh, anything that gets you relaxed? Anything that gets you relaxed, okay. right? Anything that actively relaxes you. So I think breathing is one of the best. I think genuinely think that 
Breathing is possibly the ultimate health hack. Breathing in a particular... Breathing in it, breathing consciously, not um, breathing as... You know, we all can breathe. We are all breathing without our conscious control. It's an autonomic process. But the way we breathe is information for our brain. In through the nose, out through the mouth, any of that matter? For sure. What, I mean, let me just explain why I think breathing is so important. If you are busy, Tom, right? And now you seem a super chilled guy to me, so I don't know what it's serious? like. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can be intense, yes. right? But I think you seem pretty relaxed and chilled. Hmm. But then I'm in your house as well, so I'm in, you know, I'm in your kingdom, as it were. We, we could really derail on this. It'd actually be fun for me to articulate, but I don't, we still haven't gotten back to libido, so keep going. <laughs> we, we, okay, this is, uh, so let's say you're busy. Okay, let's say a friend of yours, yes. okay, is busy. And they've got a lot of deadlines and they've got a lot of things they're juggling. Almost certainly, without them realizing it, their breathing pattern will change. Mm. They will start to breathe a little bit faster, a little bit more shallowly. They will start to breathe less from their diaphragm and more from their chest, okay? These things will happen without them even realizing it, okay? What is that doing? As you start to breathe faster, as you start to breathe more shallowly, you are sending messages to your brain, effectively saying, I am in danger, okay? Things are not good. And you start to this, um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That activates your stress response. That causes you to breathe faster and faster again. And you basically have this cycle going on. Now, the beautiful thing is you can hack that very simply because if you slowly and consciously control and slow down your breathing, right, you can send information to your brain. Hey, everything's calm. Everything's good. I am not in danger. It can be that simple. Your breath instantaneously will change. Your physiology will change your biology. Yet because we can do it without thinking about it, we walk around each day not practicing our breathing. So to pull something else in from this conversation from the start when you were talking about my morning routine, I said I used to last year for four or five months, I was using the Calm Meditation app. I do not do that currently. What I am currently doing because I've done some um, breathing work a lot this summer. I've been learning some pranayama practices. I will do five or 10 minutes of breathing in the morning now as my mindfulness. You said pranayama? Pranayama, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an Indian, uh, it's what um, a breathing practice is called in yoga, okay? What, what makes it different or how would you define it? I don't think there's anything that necessarily makes it different. I just think people have been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. They have recognized that the breath is very powerful. But so what, what is it? In through the nose, out through the mouth, diaphragm? Uh, most of three, the ones four, I've been working on are in through the nose and out through the mouth. Okay. There are various different protocols. Uh, there is, um, you know, there's a particular type of breath where you're breathing very, very fast from your abdomen. There's a whole series of different breaths. And actually, one thing I've been learning recently is that um, different people respond differently to the same breath. So actually, again, without, I know people want, what is the right breath to do? What should I go and do now? If you want that, I would say, start with a three, four, five breathing practice in through the nose and out through the nose. Start there. I think that's the optimal way to start and see how you go. But there is plenty of stuff online to start looking up different breathing practices, different techniques, and you can start figuring out what works for you. There is alternate nostril breathing. Are you familiar with that? I get it from the words, but no. Yeah, again, this all comes from yoga. I'm not claiming any of this is new. There is a way off where you breathe in through one nostril. You'll then switch. You'll breathe out through the other nostril. <laughs> then you'll breathe back in through that nostril and breathe out through the nostril that you first breathe in through. That is a very common practice. I will sometimes use that before I go to bed. What do you get from that? What do you get from that? It is... I feel really chilled and relaxed afterwards. More than if you did in through the nose, out through the mouth. More than if I do in through the nose and out through the mouth. So in the gym, in I'm trying to figure sets, out if this is like a just do variation breathing techniques or if some breathing techniques apply to one area and others to another area. I do literally one kind of breathing. I've tried Wim Hof, I will say. Yeah. That, and that was very interesting, but I don't do that on a regular basis because it makes me somewhat lightheaded. Um, so I basically just do one kind of really simple breathing. Which is what? Um, in through the nose, out through the mouth. I try to be, I try to maximize the pleasure of each part of the breath cycle. So I do in, hold, exhale, hold, in, hold, exhale, hold. So those four parts. Um, 
So like a box breathing, like a four, four, yes, four, but four. I don't do even. So yeah. that's how it started. And I found that it made me feel out of breath all the time. So I thought, let me just try to maximize the pleasure. So I'll breathe in whatever feels right. I'll hold. And when I breathe in, it's, I would say pretty normal. My hold at the, at the inhale is very short. My exhale, I literally just let it out. So it just goes. Yeah. And then my hold on the exhale tends to be very long, like 10, 15 seconds long. And so you practice a bit of breath retention. Yes, because it feels good. Yeah. And this is currently what I'm doing. I'm doing some breath retention, some breath holds So I was just in the trying morning. to figure out if the alternate nostril thing, if that has like a different effect, like it. Yeah, for sure. Like, or... look, some studies, probably not to the, uh, the, the standard that, you know, modern medicine would want to make a uh, supposition about right, it sure. ha have been done. But if you talk to yogis and people who've been practicing this for years, they will say, actually, even which nostril you go in through first and out will make a difference as to whether it activates you or whether it relaxes you, hmm. right? So you've got to figure this stuff out. Uh, this weekend, I was at an Art of Breath workshop in Santa Monica with a chap called Brian McKenzie. I feel like I've heard that You've name. got a book that he's co-written up in your green room. Yes, unplugged. he was on the show. Was Brian on the show? Yes, he works at Red Bull. Almost certainly. Hey, well, I don't know if he works at Red Bull, but I followed Brian's work for just a few months now. And when I was here, I saw he was putting on a workshop. So I went to the workshop. I interviewed him the next day for my podcast. And, you know, he talks about different protocols. They're doing a lot of research into breathing. And one of theirs is 1121, where you breathe in and you can, and 1121 is the rhythm. So you can make that if you want 10, 10, 20, 10, right? That's the, the protocol to use, but you've got to figure out what works for you. Breathing is a huge rabbit hole, mm. right? I, I'm guessing you have a lot of um, really highly motivated people listening to your show who want specific advice, right? And I guess that's where I come from a place of where I want to impact a lot of people. I want, I don't want this to seem unachievable. I know that every single person listening to this can do a simple daily breathing practice that will start to change their life. So that's why I simplify so much. It's not because I don't personally practice some things. I can get pretty obsessed with stuff, very obsessed with stuff. But also when I'm trying to communicate with the public in books or on TV or one-on-one -on -one with patients, I try and break it right down. I want to make, the, my tip for getting people to make behavior change is keep the bar super low. Start with the bar super, super low get them feeling good about themselves, doing it regularly, feeling the difference, and that will lead to them themselves going down the breathing rabbit hole. Mm. But I just wanna set them off and just show you just what is achievable. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. And that's the approach that works for me and my population. Um, so I think there are different breathing techniques. I think it is worth having a go. And so me, my mindfulness piece at the start of the day now is no longer meditation. I'm sure it will come back to that at some stage. You know, it doesn't have to be the same three M's for life. As you say, you have rules for when they work for you. When they don't, you check them out, mm. right? I'm the same. I think these three M's provide a beautiful framework for people when trying to design their morning routine, right? I think if you cover those three bases, mindfulness, movement, and mindset, you are setting yourself up for a much better day than had you not done that. Now, what you wanna do in mindfulness, there are many options. What you wanna do for your movement, there are many options. What you wanna do for your mindset, right, there are many options. Someone else might read Letting Go from David Hawkins. I go, oh God, I can't stand this book. This is putting, this is getting me, this is gonna be pissed off first thing in the morning. That's probably not the right book for you to read for your mindset piece, right? So that's why I like coming up with frameworks that people can individualize and personalize for their own lifestyle. I can't remember where we started and how we ended Libido. up there. How we ended up there was a wonderful journey, but where we started was libido. So I, when reading the book, uh, The Stress Solution, I really liked the section on relationships. I found it, in terms of somebody who wants to make sure that they don't piss people off, I was actually pretty surprised at like how, uh, what would be the right word? Not really counterintuitive, but it's very different. Like you were basically saying, look, 
If you're one, a touch diary, I thought that was super interesting. Like how often are we being touched? People aren't being touched enough. Um, and then the notion of, look, if you're in a relationship and you're not having sex, that is a problem. And then I know how many people are going to start with, well, I'm stressed and I don't really feel like it. And you're like, yo, you still need to do it. And I found that interesting. And then the pushback on like telling people it doesn't even need to be romantic. You just need to do it. I was like, whoa, he must get people saying some things. It's about funny that you say that because I've not had as much pushback as you really? might expect because you're right. I loved it. I was like, this is awesome. So two, two things I want to I want to touch on. Uh, first one is I don't feel I could have written that relationship section a few years ago. You know, Interesting. this whole theme of this whole podcast. Because you're going through it or because of the personal discovery? Because of the personal discovery. And I feel it was probably a little bit, what will people think? Right. <laughs> hey, right? What will people think? So I'm, that is probably the section of the book I'm proudest of the most, if I'm honest. So I'm, yeah. it really means a lot to me that someone like yourself, who I deeply respect, you, um, likes that part of the book and it resonated with you. That and means it's totally to me. fresh, by the way. It, it was, but that means a lot to me. Yeah, so thank you. For sure. Um, but there are various aspects to that. I think touch is important, but let's just deal with that whole sex piece. What I was trying to say is that, look, I'm trying to make the case that stress is the biggest libido killer out there. Mm. And when Do you, you have sex Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday, sometimes I don't. Almost because you're too busy. <laughs> uh, sort of. So uh, I make exceptions on Friday night. I won't lie. Uh, but usually it's more of a like almost religious thing where I'm, I'm trying to get shit done. I don't want to derail from your, your main point, but when you talk know, about stress and like, um, yeah. So my thing Monday through Friday, if I'm awake, I'm either working or working out. So there, because I really start my routine Sunday night, I'm a little lenient on Friday night. Um, but yeah, Monday through Friday, essentially, I don't have sex. As like a, I won't say it never happens, but it's really fucking rare. I feel like I'm betraying my objectives because that's too big of a statement. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that back. I'm very protective of my relationship. That's first and foremost to me, which is why I resonated with the relationship part of your book so much. And I'm, su my wife and I are super careful on the weekends to be husband and wife, to pretend like we don't have a business as much as we can and to connect and be physical and all that stuff. But yeah, Monday through Friday. I don't, but I don't. but then what I'm hearing from that is you and your wife have figured out a system that works for you, right? Yes. Monday's Friday, you guys are, I, I don't know what your wife does, but you know, you're know you hitting it hard, you're working hard or you're working out, you, yep. you're getting stuff done, but then you have intentionally created a part of your week where actually you're gonna start nourishing your relationship. That is beautiful. That is exactly, that is totally consistent with what I would be asking people to do, right? I think the problem I see as a doctor is this. Men, women, constantly coming in, complaining of low libido or not having sex. Mm. Different people in the relationship having a different perspective and a different view on that. And not just Tell the man wanting that. to have more sex and the mm. woman not. Go on. It also works the other way as well. because. Mm. One of the most um, humbling things as a doctor is that people let you into their lives. They tell you things that actually you would not otherwise generally hear from other people, right? So you really get a window into people's lives. Oh God, can you give us some examples? Obviously without any indication of who they came from. <laughs> so, I mean, look, there are so many. Let me think. Um, yeah, so look, a couple comes in. Um, and this was this this particular couple did follow what the the stereotypical path, which was the guy was very frustrated that they were not having sex anymore. Mm. So we never have sex. How old are they? How old were they? These guys were late thirties. Okay, wow. Okay, yeah, late thirties. You know, we're not having sex anymore. The uh, his partner, his wife, was having a different viewpoint, saying, "We do. We just, you know, we're busy. We're tired. We've got kids to look after." And the point I try and make in the book, and the point I made with this couple was, look. I get it. You guys have different perspectives on this, okay? Um, is it fair to say that you both would like to have more sex? You know, let's say your lifestyle did not exist. You weren't this busy. The kids weren't around all the time. Would you like to? Now, 
clearly it's much better when they agree on that. But yeah, this couple did agree. Like they were, she was like, yeah, I would love to, but it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit in. I'd rather get some sleep. I'm what so tired. What do you say to the couples that don't agree? One of them is like, no, 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 this is enough. And the other's like, uh, actually. Well, like, you know, although I don't see my job as conventionally a relationship <laughs> counselor, I got to tell you, I think my job as a generalist, a, a very proud generalist, is actually often it is psycho it's psychology mm. it is counseling not that i'm trained to do that fair right but what do you say to these couples what do i say to these it's different different libido do you say you should do it anyway um sometimes yeah some Ooh, i talk about I scheduling feel people with the negative comments poise their fingers yeah i can go. see that but look, 250 words a minute they're ready they're ready exactly but look <laughs> hear me out first so i will not impose this on people who do not want it right I take a very individual approach. So it is not a global solution. Sure. Just to be super, but, super so, clear. Uh, maybe then to explain, why is this so important? Why is touch important? Why is sex important? Like why, what the, What? does that do? These things nourish us. Because this is a book about living longer and healthier and there's a whole brilliant section about A quarter this. of the book is on relationships because right. I think it is that important. I think that a lack of close nourishing relationships is one of the biggest stresses in our lives. Just not having it. Not having it. Not so having not, a, not a toxic relationship, just not having a, a relationship. A, not having it, but B, if you do have it, right, and you're not giving attention to that relationship, if you're mm. taking that relationship for granted, I think that is incredibly toxic on your stress levels. Incredibly toxic. Why is it so important? It's important on multiple levels, right? Touch, let's go about touch. Human touch is something we have now, for very valid reasons, I might add, we have become a society that is averse to touch, right? Our, oh God, talk about a minefield. Yes, I am like, yes, I'll just say that, yes. Well, okay, there's, let's there's, revisit this. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is we have underestimated the value of human touch, how primal it is, how important it is. Now, I've really become aware of this in the last couple of years, right? I shot a, a BBC One documentary last year, no, two years ago. We were in Liverpool John Moores University with one of the world's leading researchers in our touch nerve fiber. What I learned that day blew me away. And that particular chapter, I was heavily influenced by his work. And he says this, human touch is not a sentimental human indulgence. It is a biological necessity. Dude, okay? what, uh, why? Why? So he has he and many colleagues have spent time studying something called the C tactile afferent nerve fiber. Okay, let's break that down. Why is that important? We have two different kinds of touch nerve fiber in our body. Fast mm -hmm. ones and slow ones. It is the same with pain. So let me start by explaining. It's it also with, the same with muscle twitch. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think of that. Absolutely. But they serve different roles. And can I go one further? If the book Thinking Fast and Slow can be believed, the same is true of the brain. There's regions of the brain that think fast, and then there's regions of the brain that think slowly. Well, it would make sense because touch, for example, and various different senses have to serve different roles. Mm -hmm. So I still don't understand you're about to explain the difference between fast and slow. About touch. to do this, okay. yeah. So let's start with pain. Before yep. we get into touch, let's just start with pain for a second because I think it's an easy way to get our head around it. You are in the kitchen, right? You are boiling something and the pan is super hot, right? What happens? Instantaneously, in a millisecond, you pull your hand away, right? That is because that pain signal has been transmitted along the fast nerve fiber to your brain and has told you where you've been touched, this is a problem, move it away. A few seconds later, is when the emotional quality of that pain, you might feel tearful. That's so you, true. Exactly. I noticed this with my kids. You when, pull your hand and you're like, oh shit. Yeah, my daughter, when she was four, she fell over in the back garden, right? No, on the paving. She falls over onto her knee. What uh -huh. does she do? Immediately, she just looks a bit bemused. She's rubbing her knee. She is not crying, right? About three to four seconds later, the crying kicks in. Mm. That is the slow signal saying, w w which carries the emotional quality to that pain, mm. right? So far, so clear? Yep, right. very. Let's move it to touch. So touch also has these two different nerve fibers. So 
One of those nerve fibers, the fast one, tells you geographically where you are being touched. Okay, you know, I touch you now, but you know, I've touched you there, right? That you say, oh, he has touched me on my hand. Why has he done that? Okay. There is also on our skin these C tactile afferent, CT afferent nerve fibers, which are optimally stimulated when you stroke them at three to five centimeters per second. Now, now this is this is mad. Uh -huh. When you are stroking your wife, <laughs> right? You do not have a tracking device yeah, that there. Was, that was an awkward pause right there. <laughs> when, when, yes. But, okay, when you're hugging her, when you're watching a TV right. show and you're just rubbing her arm, let's say, oh, okay, let's say when your friend is stroking their other half, right? Yes. You're not actually calculating, am I doing this at three, four centimeters per second, right? right? But when mothers are watched in a research setting, stroking their children, they all automatically lock into that speed. That's so fucking weird. It is innate, it is within us. Why? Because those nerve fibers are optimally stimulated at that point. So the next question is, where do those nerve fibers go? Those nerve fibers go all the way up to our brain, but to the emotional part of our brain, the most primitive part of our brain, and what do they do there? They serve an emotional role in our body. They help to lower the stress hormone cortisol. They increase levels of the hormone oxytocin. It lowers your heart rate when these nerve fibers are, are, are stimulated. It lowers your blood pressure. Natural killer cells, these are the part of your immune system that help fight off things like viruses and colds. Mm. Those go up significantly when the slow touch nerve fiber gets stimulated. Can I tell you something? Please. Literally last night, so my wife is traveling. Yeah. Um, so last night was going to be our last night together for, I don't know, like five nights or something. And, and we do this quite frequently. But if we need to reconnect, she just pats her lap, which means for me to take my shirt off, lay my head down, and then she just strokes my back. Dude, I would freak out if she is doing it at that thing, sort of on that tempo unknowingly. That's really interesting. I would it is bet insanely that she bonding. is. I would bet that she is. Because we're all human, we're all wired. There's, there's a certain commonality in the way we're wired. Mm. This is just something that is inbuilt. The point I'm trying to make is that we have undervalued touch. When we talk about senses, you know, you might say, you know, vision or hearing, which one would you rather lose? You know, maybe, maybe taste and smell will get a look in. Where does touch come? Like, we don't think about touch. And I think what he says, human touch is not a sentimental human indulgence. It's a biological necessity. Wow. When you read the research, it blows you away. But check this out, Tom, right? A few years ago, we're in, we're in America, right? In the NBA, the teams who touched themselves more at the start of the season- Each other? Each other were the teams who ended up higher. Get out. No, now look, I'm not trying to say there were no other components there, okay? Like just to be super clear. Sure, sure. But it is interesting. If a waiter or a waitress hands you the check, right? And they tap you on your shoulder, you will tip more. That has been shown in multiple research settings, right? The point I'm trying to make is human touch is an important, it is a fundamental part of who we are. And interestingly enough, right, when your wife strokes you like that, A, I bet she's doing it at that pace, mm. right? But B, she is also getting a benefit. So these C tactile afferents, most of them on our body, and this is gonna freak you out, are on our shoulder and upper back. That's exact, yes! Literally, that's my spot. Right. So uh, Professor McGlone talks about this and he explains that. What? That is so weird. Why there? Why? Why there? Why would we have such an important concentration of these nerve fibers on a place that we would find hard to access ourselves? Correct. Right? We're social beings. We're meant to be with other people. Evolution have put it there so that actually it brings us together and the, the giver off touch also experiences a benefit. So it's not just you who's having your CT afferent nerve fibers stimulated, right? It's not just you who's getting that and you're getting the benefit. She is also getting the benefit as well. So on an evolutionary level, it's just super, super interesting why we have such a high concentration on our back. And when me and um, Francis McGlone talk about this, we hypothesize that it is you know, it's because we are these social beings. We are meant to be together. It helps connect us. When we're with someone else or we do this, mm. it bonds us. Hey, you can do, if, I don't own a pet, but I've spoken to, since this book came out in the UK, a lot of people have asked me, well, what about when you're stroking a pet? And it appears the same thing happens. 
When you stroke your pets, not only is your pet getting a benefit, you are also getting a benefit as well. So touch is important. What is the intervention I recommend? I say keep a touch diary. Mm. I said write down how many times you are having appropriate, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just appropriate, affectionate human touch. And I say, look, after write down in one week how many times, see if the next week you can double it, you know? And then see the week after, oh, you man, can this, double it again. This, this is a very powerful, important, and dangerous topic. I'll just keep with the appropriate thing, but I will tell you a story. So I went out on a business meeting, but it was like out and about. It had to do with film. And the woman that took me out touched me, no joke, 20 times more than the average person would touch you. It was so like... So caught my attention that I, w I think at one point I actually laughed out loud because it was like <laughs> touching my shoulder, touching my arm. She would, you know, touch uh, forearm, hand, shoulder. By it was like hilarious. And I was like, and yet it's working. I couldn't believe how disarming it was. I was like, this is so weird. Like she's making me feel disarmed and relaxed. And it was super bizarre. And I thought, is she doing this on purpose or is she like optimized for something unknowingly? It was really interesting. And it was so outside the norm because you're right, people do not do that. But I couldn't believe, even though I was hyper aware of it, I was like, it still has this really weird, calming isn't right, bonding effect. It was it, super bizarre. And it's weird because it, it's become so it's become almost socially unacceptable to do that. Oh, now. that I, the whole right. time I'm like, does she know you can't do this? Like yeah. you can't touch people like this. Yeah. And even, like I, 10 years ago in my consultation room, if I was delivering bad news to someone, right, I would probably sit close, lower my tone. I may well put my hand on their back, mm -hmm. you know, to, to deliver in a very caring and compassionate way. I, I rarely do that these days. Dude, I, I'm I am, insane. I am scared. I'm like, Maybe not even consciously. I'm just aware that this is not appropriate. You know, be very careful. You know, my, hey, I'm saying that in this quest to keep us safe, which I totally get and I support, right? <laughs> I am just raising the question, have there been unintended consequences? Mm. Have we underestimated touch? I think for guys, this is a huge problem. You know, since I dived into this research, I hug my buddies more, right? When I meet them now, instead of that, you know, that high five or the handshake, you know what? Often now I give them a hug, right? Not in a weird way, but, and it feels good. And you notice a response from it. Mm. Um, I talk about something in the book, which I think you'll like called the 3D greeting, right? And I, it's, the, it's in the piece on intimacy. It's in this eye whole- Eye contact, voice, and touch. Yeah, greet your partner or greet someone close to you in three dimensions. As you say, you know, eyes, voice, and touch. I actually genuinely do this with my wife in the morning for 15 seconds. Oh, do you guys do the staring at each other for five minutes thing? Oh, we did it once, man. I was <laughs> like, oh, I don't know if I Have you that. tried it? No. Man, please, I, I beg you to it try it. It sounds so weird. Yeah, I mean, th this was, an, uh, I was at an event and, um, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was an event of doctors actually. And, you know, one of the sessions was about, uh, I think it's about breathing or meditation. And it was an exercise, of, you know, that we were to participate in. So we had to find a seat, sit opposite someone who we didn't know, right, randomly. Mm -hmm. And then you had to go through this process that I do describe in the book. That with course, the knees touching and everything? Yeah. With it. So this was a girl, right, who I didn't know. And we sat together, knees touching. And then we have to look into each other's eyes for five minutes without looking away. Man, it is so deeply uncomfortable. Yes. Right? And what struck me at the end was, oh my God, I've just spent five, year, five minutes looking into another woman's eyes. I don't think I've ever, ever done that with my own wife, right? So for me, it was like, it was really, it was really educational on one level. I thought, this is mad, I've just done that. But what's really weird is when you do it, it starts off feeling uncomfortable. People mm. are trying to look away but you sort of get into it and you you can pick up so much. You can look, you know, it feels as though you're looking deep into someone's soul, right? You really start to pick up things. Again, that was a learning experience for me. I thought, wow, I should do that with my wife. And we have done it. Mm, but only we, once. Only once, but now- Because it's weird? No, but you know what? 
just because life gets busy and we're, you know, I've not thought about it again. So I'm going to make a commitment to you on air now, Tom. I'm <laughs> going to go back when I fly back on Friday night. I'm going to do this with my wife. Um, I am because I want to actually. I would love to actually redo it. Right, I think I'll have a, to do it with Lisa as well then. Yeah, text right. me. I'll text you. All see right, how it goes. Because it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's really insightful. I'm not saying this is not something I'm recommending people do day in day out. What I am recommending people think about doing is the 3D greeting. Mm. Many people listening to this will be so busy in the mornings. They'll be rushing around trying to get out for work. If they've got kids, trying to get them off. You are like passing ships with your other half quite often. This has changed and transformed my relationship. 15 seconds in the morning where we'll hug. I will look her in the eyes. I will say something nice. She will say something nice to me. And you know the mad thing, Tom? Since the book came out, so many people send me a, a DM on Instagram and they say, Dots Chastity, you know, that 3D greeting thing, like I've been trying it and it's making a huge difference. One lady, and not just one, many people have said this to me, but one lady in particular said, Dots Chastity, I've been trying this with my husband. He doesn't know that I'm doing it, <laughs> right? And it is changing everything. He's happier, he's calmer, he's mm. more present with the kids. Dude, that's so bananas. Yeah. Like this really simple shit that makes such a big difference to just hug your partner, look them in the eye, say something nice, touch. It's crazy. The science is there. We know intuitively. We're just missing the big picture. We're getting sidetracked down the route of what is this tech going to tell us, right? Again, I'm not anti that. I'm just saying let's not forget about the basics. How often should people have sex? I it don't think depends. I, I, uh, yeah, you know I'm going to say that. Give me, give me, give me some, like, say that. Give me some ideals here. Uh, I would say in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm talking should, with a significant you, other. Yeah, but you should be doing it at a time. I, th I think you should probably have that conversation with each other and actually not leave this thing to be that thing out that you don't really talk about. That you actually mm -hmm. have an open, upfront conversation. The you know, in a couple, one 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 half says how much they would ideally like. The other half says what they would ideally like. If there is a big discrepancy, agree on a compromise. I'm right? talking at a bio the biological necessity. Let level. me come to that because I think this is super important, Tom. Okay. Right? It is simply, and this is the point I was trying to make about people should schedule sex. I was trying to make the point, I use this tip with many of my patients, and actually it brings the romance and intimacy back into their relationship. Mm. They are too stressed to have sex. They don't feel like it. I'm saying, would you consider for four weeks putting it in the diary as you would diary in anything else in your schedule? More often than not, they will come back a few weeks later. Not always, and there's often other, other issues to deal with. More often than not, people will come back and say, the act of putting it in the diary, the act of prioritizing it, the act of prioritizing that other half actually has led to more connection, has led to more intimacy, has often led to them having more sex. So I think not having any sex, not having intimacy leads, that becomes the, the self-fulfilling prophecy. And what I was trying to say, and it feels very apt to say this because I'm now here in, you know, we're in Beverly Hills, I think. Yeah. You know, and, um, I, you know, I've been in Hollywood this morning. I say the movies have given us, have sold us this artificial idea of what a relationship is, that it's about the prince and princess, is that actually, you know what, we can only be intimate with our partners when everything is perfect, when the lighting is right, when the candles are there, when we feel chilled out. That is not real life, right? Real life is busy, real life is hard. I am all for romance, but I think, and I have seen this, this is where this comes from from me. I am giving you my experience, my clinical experience as a doctor. I'm looking at the science, but I'm also marrying it with what I've seen in real life. Mm. And I think for many people, they are simply not prioritizing it. They are not scheduling it. They know the curvy contours of their iPhone <laughs> more than they know the curvy contours of their partner, right? And I think there's something in that. And I guess some of those words are quite provocative in the book, but I haven't had that much pushback. I think people all recognize that this is an mm. issue. In terms of the answer, you would like to know how often on a biological level should people be having sex? Honestly, I don't know, but I would speculate twice a week. Okay. If I don't like being pushed on exacts, but you like pushing me, so I'm gonna say twice a week. Is there such thing as too much? Are you asking for a friend? I'm asking for a friend, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, assuming no friction burns or anything like that, like is there a point at which you're now diminishing returns? I think there probably is, yeah. I think with, with anything, there is a sweet at spot. At a biological level? 
I am not an expert on that, so sure. I don't want to proclaim to be. Um, I think it's got to be the right amount in the context of the rest of your life. It's got to leave you feeling energized. It's got to help you feel closer, uh, more intimate, more connected. It should have a knock-on effect on other aspects of your life. If it doesn't, of course, there could be other factors there, mm. but I think that's what people should be looking for, not just that act of having sex is what else is going on? Does it change the fabric? Does it change the texture of your relationship? And I would say people give it a go, you know? If, I don't know if your audience is predominantly male or female, do you know? It's about 60, 40 okay, to so, male. So pretty evenly. So, you know, people are listening to this, maybe, you know, ask your other half to listen to this part or, or read that section of the book and maybe come up with an agreement and just try it. I would, I, I would make the contention that we experiment in all aspects of our life. We try a certain workout for a few days, see if it agrees with us. We try a diet for a little while, see, do we feel good on this? If you are dissatisfied with the intimacy in your relationship, right? If you feel you would like to connect more with your other half, try the 3D greeting for seven days. Try that for 15 seconds per day. I guarantee you will feel a difference. And if you feel that you're not having enough sex, A, try the 3D greetings, I think that will help connect you. Put it in the diary, like your gym session, like the meeting you have with your boss, like the kids party you've got to take your four-year-old son to. Put intimacy in the diary. Now, I do clarify in the book, I'm talking about scheduling intimacy. It does not have to mean sex every time. It could be, you know, I don't know, take a shower with your partner, right? And you may ask me, Tom, why is it that in 2019, we have a doctor having to say stuff like this, right? That would be a great question. Yeah, but the reality is I am responding to the things that I see in my clinic. These are the problems that people are suffering with today. Therefore, I want to give people tools that work, that are accessible, that are absolutely practical for them to do, that work for the complaints that people come to see me with today. Mm maybe 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't need a doctor telling you this stuff. But even, well, how old is all this modern tech? How old are smartphones? 10, 10 years? When was the first iPhone? Uh, 12 years, came out in 2007, I think. 2007, 12 years ago. Before that time, I think intimacy was much less of an issue, right? I really think technology, for all its benefits- You gave some stats in the book that were a little chilling in terms of how much less sex we're having now, which is crazy. It is crazy. And there are differing stats saying different things, right? But just imagine this, I think we can, I think many of us will resonate with this, this whole idea that we are physically in the same location with our partners, but mentally we're not in the same place. Mm. You're in the same room, okay, you're in the same bed. You're lying on one half, partner on the other half. You are physically a few, centimeters away from each other, but in your heads, you could be millions of miles away. Mm. We're in our personalized worlds. We've got our own uh, emails. We've got our own social media feeds. We've got our own, Netflix is feeding us exactly what we want. Actually, it is very hard for a fellow human being to compete with what an algorithm is feeding you <laughs> to your own desires. This is having consequences because what if the reason we're not having as much sex as before is simply because we're not allowing those opportunities to develop. Let's say pre-technology, what are two people doing in bed? They can't go on their email, right? They can't go on social media. Mm. They might read a book. They might talk. They might have a conversation. They might hug, hug and that might lead to intimacy of some sort. I don't mean always sex. It might just lead to more intimacy. It is almost like a cliche now that we're, again, uh, I, I, I have, on reflection, I have said some quite controversial things in the book. You know, I, I, as I say, we're all having eye affairs with our partners, or with our phones, you know? And I think if people sit and reflect on that, you know, I think it's an issue. And simply intentionally removing the phone from the bedroom, for example, not only will I think that help your sleep, will help you lower your stress levels. If you are lucky enough to have a long-term partner, right? if that is what you want, and you do have a long-term partner, I genuinely believe it will transform your relationship, not over weeks, within days. Mm. Magical shit, man. 
Good place to tap out. Thank you, brother. That was incredible. Good to have you back on the show. Love the book, The Stress Solution. Check it out. If for nothing else, you got to read that section on relationships. <laughs> Fantastic. But thank you, man, for being here. Thanks for having me on, Tom. Look Absolutely. forward to the next time, buddy. Definitely. Everybody listening, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. And until then, be legendary. Take care, my friends. Peace. Man, that was deep. That was good shit, dude. That was good. For people who are struggling with their diets and they're struggling with what to eat, I would say, why don't you focus on when you eat? When you eat is arguably as important or certainly of critical importance as well as what you eat.